We knew it was a key component of the agenda. Yeah. And one of the things that came out of the Rio Summit, the mm -hmm. Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, was known as the Convention on Biological Diversity. Yeah. It's a treaty that uh, about 100 nations signed right there at the convention. Now, President Bush took one look at that treaty. It's only 18 pages long. Mm -hmm. It's a motherhood and apple pie statement. It's based on what is known as this biocentrism, mm -hmm. but it really doesn't explain the consequences of that. Yeah. And he says, how can I? I legitimately sign something in the name of the American people mm -hmm. when I don't even know how it's going to be executed because it had no enabling language, uh, no implementing language whatsoever. Right. It was a statement of principles, uh, motherhood and apple pie, how can you disagree with these types of things, mm -hmm. protect our environment, protect biodiversity mm -hmm. and all the rest. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, I cannot sign this in good consciousness because I don't know how it's going to be implemented. Thank I'd be signing God. a blank check. Thank God. He Thank God. Right. But President Bush did, or President Clinton did sign it. Yes. In fact, was eager to sign it mm -hmm. and signed it uh, very quickly in 1993. It was in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for 12 months. With a recommend, came out in 1994 with a recommendation to to ratify. How can a U.S. Senate take a 18-page treaty that says absolutely nothing, nothing. and ratify it and leave it up to environmental leadership to fill in the blanks? It's beyond me, but that's what they recommend. No, but they're not doing the job they were elected to do. They're not doing the job, and it's a very serious responsibility to ratify a treaty. You bet it is. Because especially in recent Supreme Court history, this was not the way the Founding Fathers intended it, but in recent Supreme Court history, the treaty becomes the supreme law of the land okay. and supersedes state and federal law. Now, it was intended that way, but that's that, not the intent. But that, that, that's the, how it's been the interpreted. Right. That's okay. right. And so they were undertaking a tremendous responsibility and just very casually said, "Well, this sounds good." Warm and funny, just fuzzy in the belly, and they and they ratified it. Or they tried to ratify it. Tried to ratify. We stopped them once through a lot of work that you on the Outdoor Channel here did in 1994 in August and, and a number of other organizations across this mm -hmm. nation. We got a, a fax alert out alerting people, and by the following afternoon, uh, the U.S. Senate said that we must have reached over a million people, mm. probably four million people yeah. in that period of time, astonishing, yeah. that called in to the U.S. Senate and said, don't ratify this without further review. And in fact, 35 senators then stood up, conservative senators, stood up and said, we will not ratify that. And, and obviously, with 35, they couldn't because they, could they needed a two-thirds majority. Right. right. And so we got it delayed for a month, thank God, because in the meantime, we had been telling the Senate all of this time mm -hmm. that there was a document called the United Nations Global Biodiversity Assessment that was to be used according to Article 25 of the treaty to write the implementing language. It was wow. to be the basis. It was to be the foundation. Oh. And if they wanted to see the magnitude of what this implementing language might look like, they needed to get a hold of the copy of the mm -hmm. global, global Biodiversity Assessment, or GBA as I call it for right. short, right. Uh, and review that. Well, the Senate did require, or did try to get that document several times mm -hmm. during the summer of 1994, only to be told by the United Nations, listen to this, this document not only did not exist, there was no intention of ever writing this document, and that the Senate needs to ratify this because it's an ongoing process. On September 29th, we finally got the document out of Switzerland oh, through a series of uh, rather covert actions. Yes, we will not mention those. We will not mention those, <laughs> but no, got it as 3,000 pages to explain an 18-page oh, treaty. Oh, gosh. And in the process of doing this, we found, not, we went into a state of shock. We yeah. never dreamed in our wildest imaginations that this document would be as anti-human as it was. Mm -hmm. It literally called for a total remake of human civilization around the world uh, in very, very dire language. Mm -hmm. And the, the concept, and we'll go through some of these uh, momentarily, mm -hmm. but the concept of these uh, literally would call for, as you mentioned before, a vast reduction in human population or all of us need to become agrarian peasants. Oh, oh okay. Yes. The Soviet system rears its ugly head. Exactly. Hair. I see. Or, if you want to call it that, it's, the, it's patterned after the old feudal system of Europe. Feudal system. Where you have a right. very small percentage of people in control with a high standard of living for mm -hmm. the conditions that exist. And then the vast majority, 90 to 95 percent plus of the population, are serfs that support that very small. We could be their little serfs. We could be their little people. servants. And, and I fighters. see. I see. And Interesting. 
God. I don't think that's what I think of as America. No, definitely not. Not what the framers intended for America. Exactly. At all. You know, we're going to come back for our next segment, Mike. Just stay right there. And I know the people are just glued to their seats. So uh, we'll be right back for segment two of Focus. Kaufman of Environmental Perspectives. And we were really rolling on the biological diversity and the treaty and the implementation and all of this egregious language that really basically strips away not only our rights as Americans, but our rights to even live on this earth as human beings. That's right. And it's amazing. When we got the, the Global Biodiversity Assessment out of the United Nations, what we found is candidness there that we had never seen before. We had been able to read between the lines and we pick up this little bit of information here and that little bit of information. But here in one document was their whole agenda. Oh. And it's an incredible agenda, especially in sections 8, 9, and 10. Oh. And in section 9, for instance, it talks about the fact that the worldview of nature has come full circle now from when Christianity began to dominate and build Western civilization. Mm -hmm. We're going back to the pantheistic belief system. Uh -huh. And it predominates not only in the environmental leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually states this in this document. Mm -hmm. But it also is within the World Wildlife Fund for Nature, uh -huh. the IUCN, the World Resources Institute. These are the three organizations that wrote the Convention on Biological Diversity. Mm -hmm. It is the center of the United Nations General Assembly itself. They mm -hmm. admit this. Uh -huh. Uh, and the fact that the goals and so forth, that is the underlying goal for the Convention on Biological Diversity. Mm. And it's, it was shocking when you recognize uh, how candid and how blatant they were in these United Nations documents and spelling out that the whole thing is based on their religious beliefs. Well, no wonder they didn't want you to see it. And, it's and exactly pretended right. And did not exist. And pretended as if it did not exist, hoping that the Senate would ratify it before they found out exactly what was in these what documents. Yeah. And the key here is that they plan according to Table 5 in Sections 9.2, mm -hmm. to totally reorganize the world civilization around a set of principles that are based on four key principles. The first one is that human beings are merely one strand in nature's web. We've got to, as a culture, accept that philosophical belief that we are just one little small strand in nature's web. We have no rights beyond that. Mm, Secondly, that all living creatures have to be considered equal. That gets into this whole biocentric philosophy mm -hmm. that just totally dominates their particular thinking. And then finally, the na that the natural way is right and that mankind must pattern all of our activities after, this is a quote, nature's rhythms. Now what does that mean? Is it means that we're sitting in a studio here. Mm -hmm. Is this part of nature's rhythms? Hmm. No, it's not. Mm -mm. Almost anything that we do in our civilized world are not part of mm -hmm. nature's rhythms. Mm -hmm. Now, we draw on it, and we're based ultimately in utilizing natural resources, utilizing good stewardship to provide timber products, paper, yes. uh, minerals, and other sundry things. Uh, we do not want to negate the, the principle of good stewardship. Right. But on the other hand, we are not following nature's rhythms. And yet, this would mandate in all of our legislation and so forth that we do that. And there would be no room for civilization in that process. And finally, the fact, uh, the first, fourth point is that not, not, nature not only has uh, its own inherent rights in the form of material goods that we are used to utilizing to sustain our standard of living, mm -hmm. but it also has spiritual values mm -hmm. that we must adhere to and uh, cultural values that we must bend our culture to. Again, forcing us through legislation to become pantheists. To become basically pantheists, to set up a state religion. A state religion. religion, there you are. Exactly. Oh, and my. most people have no idea that this is what's happening because they use language and so forth that does not necessarily sound religious. I believe they call it wordsmithing. Wordsmithing, that's oh. right. Yeah, well, yes. Enough to gag on. <laughs> and of course, it's what we talked about before the break is that if you have this philosophical belief that we must adapt to nature's rhythms, then obviously the human population has exceeded Mm -hmm. the earth's carrying capacity, mm -hmm. and that we must do one of two things. We either must become thirst, oh, okay. like the old feudal system, where mm -hmm. all of us are just kind of agrarian uh, peasants. That's right. a better word, agrarian peasants. Agrarian That's peasants, okay. Direct quote out you of the... You can either sign up to be an agrarian pre yes, peasant or... Or we have to reduce the earth's population of humans from the five and a half billion people that we presently have today 
to about 1 billion people within 30 to 50 years. So who says which 4.2 billion or whatever it is aren't worth anything anymore and they have to go? Well, I've asked some of the environmental <laughs> leaders, well, if you really believe that, why don't you offer yourself up on 